For those of you that were with us last Sunday, we've begun a new series. We are walking through the last sermon of Jesus Christ as he spoke to his disciples in John chapters 14, 15, 16, and 17. We're going to talk about what it means to have life with Christ. What does that actually look like? And so just as we walked through Jesus' first words in his Sermon on the Mount, we will do the same as we continue on in hearing God speak to us. You know, I firmly believe that Jesus really desired that his disciples know what he wanted to share with them that evening. And I also believe that Jesus really wants us to know what he wants to share with us this morning from these same passages. And so we're in John chapter 14. This morning, we're going to be looking at verses 15 through 21. If you love me. I suppose I should say, my name is Pastor Jeff, and good morning. Welcome to the gathering. So glad that you guys are with us this morning. Come to worship the Lord with us. You know, God has laid on my heart to pray for the other churches in northern Thailand as well. And so each Sunday, we're going to pray for a specific church. And this morning, I would like us to pray for Pa Kham Baptist Church and Pastor Saman Chantawong. And let's pray for them and for us that we would be given the ability by God himself to hear his words and to apply those words in a meaningful way to our lives. Let's pray. Bow with me this morning, if you will. Father God, we love you. And we know that your will will be done. We pray that it will happen right now. We pray your heart prayer, Father. Your will be done. Your kingdom come on this earth. That everything you want to accomplish this morning will be accomplished. That any hindrance would be cast aside. And that, Father, we would look to you and that you would give us the ability to understand what your word has for us this morning. God, thank you so much for your word. Thank you that we live in a time that your word is available to us in our heart language. That we can access it and know your word and hear you speak through us and to us through your spirit. Father, I pray that this morning. Give us, give us those ears that can hear, those hearts that can respond to you, Father. And I pray for the same for Pakam Baptist Church and Pastor Saman Chantawong. God, speak. Speak clearly. Let us know that we met with Almighty God in the person of Jesus Christ this morning, we pray. And it's in the name of Jesus that we come before you, God. Amen. Now, if you were with us last week, you know that we also ended on two or three specific verses. Look at John chapter 14, verses 12 through 14. That's where we ended last week. And as you turn there, I want us to remember what we know to be true of this passage. See, Jesus has just told his disciples that he's going away and that they cannot follow him. And of course, he is talking about the cross. He calls it going to his father, going to prepare a place for us, dying that we can be made right before God and have a place in heaven with him. But when Jesus said this, the disciples went into a panic. And they started actually arguing with Jesus and, and telling, no, Jesus, you're wrong. No, no, no. Wow. We, we would never deny you. Peter himself says, Jesus, I'll even die for you. And we know famously, Jesus says, Peter, you're going to deny me three times that you even knew me. It says, the Bible says that the other disciples said the same thing. Oh, no, no, Jesus, you're wrong. We're never going to leave you. But of course, Jesus was true. And so Jesus began in John 14 to speak words of comfort that those disciples needed to hear to face what they were about to face in watching their Messiah be killed. 
And God wants to speak to our hearts this morning for things that we may be facing even now. And God wants us to hear that he is indeed the way. He is our assurance of a future hope. He is the truth. He is our wisdom right now for today. And he's the life. He is the strength and power we need right now. All that we need is in the person of Jesus Christ. And that was what Jesus told his disciples. And that's what he's telling us this morning. But then he said these words. Look at John chapter 14, verses 12 through 14. And Jesus said, Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever believes in me will also do the works that I do. And greater works than these will he do, because I am going to the Father. Whatever you ask in my name, this I will do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask me anything in my name, I will do it. And I promised last Sunday that we would, Lord willing, discuss these questions that come into our minds. See, because when we read this passage, two specific questions historically come into our thoughts. One, what are these greater works that Jesus is saying we'll do? Greater than even he did. And, and two, how can Jesus promise to answer any prayer we make in his name that he will do it? How does that work? And I believe that those questions are specifically answered in the next passage of Scripture. That Jesus answers the questions of what these greater works are. He answers the question on how it works when he says, If you ask me anything in my name, I will do it. So let's look. Look with me. John chapter 14, verses 15 through 31. We're not going to read all verses right now. We're going to stop at verse 19, but Lord willing, we'll cover all the passage today. But look with me as we read in John chapter 14, starting with verse 15. And, and here in the sanctuary and you online, let me encourage you, read this in your heart language. I'll be reading it in English, but read God's word in your heart language that the Holy Spirit will speak to your deepest part of your heart. And Jesus said, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another helper to be with you forever. Even the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him. You know him, for he dwells with you and will be in you. I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. Yet a little while, and the world will see me no more. But you will see me, because I live. You also will live. Jesus starts this next section off and says, If you love me, you will keep my commandments. Well, let me just tell you, when I was younger, actually for many years, I struggled with this verse. You, it wouldn't be too far off to say I, I didn't want to hear this verse because it made me afraid. Because as I read or heard it preached, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. This is what I heard. I would hear it backwards. I would hear, if you don't obey me perfectly, you don't really love me. That's what I thought Jesus was saying here. And it scared me. Because, you know, I thought I loved Jesus. I, I wanted to love Jesus. I wanted to give him my heart and my life. But anytime I tried to go any length of time without sinning, just like the Apostle Paul says in Romans 7, what I don't want to do, that's what I end up doing. And what I want to do, I find within me, I just can't do it. And so I would hear, if you love me, you keep my commandments. And I would feel the condemnation that I thought those words held. And maybe you guys hear that too. Maybe sometimes you feel that way, that when you sin, that God is, is sitting there and ready to push down and, and crush you. Or he feels disappointed. Well, let me just say, as we study this passage together, we will see that that's not what Jesus is saying at all. He's speaking words of comfort to his disciples, not condemnation. 
Look at the context again. Jesus just told his disciples he's going away, and they start panicking and arguing with him, and he loves them. He tells them, listen, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. You're going to come to the Father through me. Let me give you a promise. John chapter 13, verse 1, the beginning of this whole section, it says, and Jesus loved his disciples and he loved them to the end. And this is part of that love. Jesus is comforting them. Let me tell you what Jesus is saying here, and we'll see it from the scripture. Jesus is saying to his disciples as they're wrestling with the fact that he's going to leave them and they can't follow him. He's, the, the, their whole world is about to change. Jesus says, I understand what you're going through. Let me help you. He says, I know you want to love me, but right now you're not listening to me. You're struggling against the words that I'm saying, and your hearts are wrestling with me. No, believe in me. That's what we saw last week, John 14, 1. Believe in me. Trust me. You say that you love me, but it is those who love me who also listen to me and keep my words. Look at that word keep for a moment. If you love me, you will keep my commandments. You know, in the Greek, that word literally means to guard. If you remember the Roman soldiers that were placed by the Jewish leaders to guard Jesus' tomb, literally they are called keepers. It's the same word. The apostle Peter, when he was arrested, the Bible says that two Roman soldiers were chained to him to keep him there in prison. Over and over we see that this word literally means to guard. Later on, the apostle Paul had a soldier that guarded him, kept him. The idea is this. Make sure that what you have does not get away. Guard it. For us, when we're talking about Jesus' words, he's saying, if you love me, you will love my words too. You'll treasure what I'm telling you. You will guard it in your heart. You will hold on to it. You'll protect it. It will become valuable to you. In fact, Jesus, when he was praying in John 17, verses 11 and 12, Jesus actually uses this word and helps define it for us. Look at John 17, verses 11 and 12. Just a few chapters over, Jesus is praying about his disciples, and he says this, I am no longer in the world, Father, but they are in the world, and I'm coming to you. Holy Father, keep them in your name. Hold on to them. Guard them, Father. Keep them in the name that you have given me, that they may be one even as we are one. While I was with them, I kept them in your name which you have given me. I have guarded them. And not one of them has been lost except the son of destruction that the scripture might be fulfilled. It's the same idea. See, Jesus could have used the word obey, but he didn't. He says, keep my words. Treasure what I say to you. If you really love me, you'll value me as God, as your master and Lord, and you'll want to obey me. So here's what's going to happen. If you want to keep my words, love me. John 14, 1, he says, believe in me just as you believe in the Father. And now he says, love me. Focus on loving me. Put your heart towards me. The psalmist writes in Psalm 119, verse 11, the same idea, he says, I have stored your word in my heart. I've guarded it. I've kept your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. The psalmist writes, I love you, God, so much. And I'm focused on loving you that a, a, a manifestation of that, a, a reason, a cause that happens because I love you is that I find that I don't want to sin against you. I want to live to please you. So the first step Jesus says is, love me. Because the disciples, the apostles were struggling. Telling God he was wrong. Telling Jesus, no, no, you don't know me, Jesus. I'll never deny you. And of course, Jesus is God. He knows everything. 
So Jesus says, listen, with a relationship with me, I am everything you need. But in order for us to have this relationship, you must love me. Now, remember, what is the biblical definition of love here? We're talking about the biblical definition of love. Let me define that for you. Love is wanting what's best for the person that you love, the object of your love. We see that in John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he sent his son to die. He loved us so much that he said, I want what's best for you. And what is best for you is not to be separated from God eternally in a place called hell, a place that's not even made for us. It was created for the devil and his angels because they could see God in all his glory and still rebelled at him. Jesus says, that's not where we should go. That's not where God wants us to go. Our best is to be with God forever. To enjoy a relationship of love with Almighty God and with His Son, Jesus Christ. That's the best. And so when Jesus says, love me, He says, put my best first. Now, the cool thing is, Jesus does not stop talking here. He's face to face with the apostles and the disciples that are arguing with him, telling him he's wrong. And Jesus doesn't just say, if you'd obey me, you'd really love me. You don't love me and walk out. No, he doesn't do that at all. He keeps talking. He says, I understand you're struggling. Let me help you love me. And so in these next verses, we will see that Jesus gives us three promises, three specific promises that he himself will help us love him. Because he knows we're frail. He knows we are dust, the scripture tells us. And Jesus says, you need my help. You can't even love me without my help, and I'm okay with that. Let me help you love me. And the first one he sends is the promise of the encourager of love. Look what he says, starting with verse 15 again. If you love me, you will keep my commandments. And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another helper to be with you forever. Even the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it neither sees him nor knows him. You know him, for he dwells with you and will be in you. I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. Yet a little while and the world will see me no more. But you will see me. Because I live, you also will live. Jesus says, if you love me, then you'll listen to me. And as you're loving me and wanting to listen to me and trying to obey, I, you know what's going to happen? I'm going to go to my father and I'm going to ask him. And he's going to give you this promise. The promised promise helper. That word in the Greek literally means somebody who comes alongside and helps, encourages, strengthens. Advocate is another word that's used. Someone who's on your side, who wants your best. See, that's the biblical definition of love. Jesus says, I'm going to ask the Father, and he's going to love you by putting his Holy Spirit in you. Now, who is this helper? How, how is the Holy Spirit who is he specifically? He's God. The spirit sent from God, Jesus says later on in the passage. He's the spirit of truth, Jesus said here. If you remember from last week, Jesus just got done saying, I am the truth. I'm the way, the truth, and the life. Jesus is saying, it's me. I will be within you. I will help you love me. He says it right here. He says, you know him. You know who this spirit is, for he dwells with you. I'm right here and will be in you. I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. Jesus says, I will be in you. I will help you love me. I will be life for you. I will help you see me. I will help you know me. I will help you in everything you need for this life. You may not understand it now, but one day you will. And this is the promise. I will help you love me. 
Because that's what Jesus just had done saying. If you love me, you will obey me. You will keep my commandments, even better than obey me. You will keep and treasure my words. And I'll ask the Father, and he'll send a helper, someone to help you love me. This is a promise. Jesus says in verse 17, he's the spirit of truth. Whom the world cannot receive, because it neither sees him nor knows him. You know, the world cannot receive the spirit of truth, because it refuses to believe in Jesus. Those in this world, they, they demand to see signs, or to hear explanations that fit their own worldview. They don't want to believe, they don't want to repent, they don't want to submit And even like the Pharisees, when Jesus did show them miracles, they still refused to believe. Because they couldn't receive the Holy Spirit. They refused to submit their lives to the king of all kings. And Jesus says, but you believe in me. John chapter 13, when he was, Jesus is washing the disciples feet. He literally tells them already, you're already clean. John chapter 15, he'll say it again. You're already clean because of the words I've spoken to you. You're mine, Jesus says. So love me. Focus on loving me. Wanting my best. Keeping and treasuring what I tell you. And I promise that I will send my spirit into you, the spirit of God. And he will help you love me. The apostle Paul In Romans chapter 5, Joyce, you scared me a little bit when I said Romans 5 because I stopped at verse 5. You kept going 6 through 9, so praise the Lord. Obviously, God wanted us to study Romans 5 this evening as well, this morning as well. Romans chapter 5, listen to what Paul writes about this Holy Spirit. He says, therefore, since we've been justified by faith, that is, we've received God's forgiveness already through faith in his Son, we have peace with God Through our Lord Jesus Christ. We're at peace with God. Through Jesus, we've also obtained access into this grace in which we stand. And we rejoice in hope of the glory of God. Not only that, but we rejoice in our sufferings. Knowing that suffering produces endurance. Endurance produces character. And character produces hope. And this hope never puts us to shame. Why? How can we look at life and see difficulties and and sufferings and say, this is good? How can we do that? Verse 5, because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. Paul says, "I, I look at my life completely different now. I look at everything that I go through as coming through the hands of a loving father. I may not understand it. It may be suffering, but it's for my best and it's for his glory because he loves me. And that's the definition of love. God wants my best. Not necessarily what I want, but what's my best. And so Jesus says, I promise to send this encourager of love. Later on, John in his letter in John, 1 John chapter 4, verse 19, John says the same thing. He says, you know what? We love God because he first loved us. Receive Jesus' love. Meditate on his love. Embrace his love. And know that the first promise for you and for I, those who have put our faith in Jesus Christ, this first promise is true. There's no waiting period. No delay. Jesus doesn't talk about anything that says you have to wait for a second helping or anything like that. He says, no, I'm going to ask the Father and he will give you the spirit of truth. But that's not all. That's that's just the first promise. What Jesus says in this passage to his disciples. Knowing they need the comfort to go through what they're about to go through. Jesus says, not only will I give you the encourager to love. But I will give you The embrace of love. Let's keep reading. John chapter 14. Look, Drop down to verses 20 and 21. Jesus says, In that day, you will know that I am in the Father, 
and you in me and I in you. Whoever has my commandments and keeps them, he it is who loves me. And he who loves me will be loved by my father and I will love him and manifest myself to him. What is he saying here? Well, he says in that day because he hasn't died on the cross yet. He hasn't gone to be with the Father yet. He hasn't asked the Father to send the Spirit yet, but he will soon. For those of us who are believers in Jesus, that day has already happened. We have the Holy Spirit now. That's why the Apostle Paul could say, this is the truth. We already have the Holy Spirit. He's helping us love the Father. Now, what is Jesus saying here? In that day, you'll know that I'm in the Father, and you in me, and I in you. You know, the best way I could describe this is with a visual. And this is going to be interesting because I, I think I need a third hand. But this will work out. We'll, we got this. This is you and me. This box represents us. And Jesus says, starting from the back, working to the front, he says, in that day, I will be in you. So we've got the Holy Spirit who loves us and wants us to love the Father, and he'll be in us. With me so far? Still awake? Okay. But that's not all. He says, in that day you'll know that you are in me. So not only is Jesus in you, but you are in him. Paul says we have so many blessings because we are in him, in Christ. So now we have Jesus in us, but we're also in Jesus. We're wrapped up in his love, but, but that's not all. But wait, there's more. Jesus says, and I am in the Father. I want you to think about this because this is the the reality of life for you and for me right now. We are completely wrapped up in the love of God. I don't care how you feel sometimes. I don't care how I feel sometimes. The truth of God's word that Jesus himself told his disciples, he said, you know what? You're going to see me die on the cross. You're going to see me look frail and weak, and you're going to think everything is lost and hopeless. But you know what? You're trusting your eyes. Don't trust your eyes. Trust me and my truth. Listen to my word. Keep my words. In that day, you will know we are wrapped up in each other. We are all around you. The love of the Father that he has for the Son is ours. Our inheritance is in Christ. Why? Because the Father loves the Son, and we're in the Son. And not only that, but the Son is in us. The Holy Spirit is in us. This visual... I'm going to do this. This visual is why the Apostle Paul writes in Romans chapter 8, verses 35 through 39... Who shall separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus? Who? Who can separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or stress or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? No. As it is written, for your sake, we are being killed all the day long. We are regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. He's saying these things happen. Bad things happen. Troubles happen in this life. But do they defeat us? Do they knock us out of the Father? No. Verse 37. No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. It's not because now we have all this ability and wonderness and I'm the conqueror. No, it's because we are wrapped up in the love of Christ and the love of the Father. And nothing can defeat the love of the Father and the love of Christ. For I am sure. Let's read this together. Verse 38 and 39. Let's read this together. For I am sure that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all of creation 
will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Jesus tells his disciples, do you love me? Focus on that love. Treasure what I'm telling you. Because the truth of the matter is one day the promise is revealed and I will be in you. And not only that, but my father and I will come and dwell with you and embrace you. And there's nothing that will take you out of our love. Nothing. And then Jesus promises, I'm the example of that love. Let's look back at John chapter 14 again. Jump down to verse 24. Jesus tells his disciples, whoever does not love me does not keep my words. And the word that you hear is not mine, but the father's who sent me. Look what he says there. The word that you hear is not mine, but it's the father's who sent me. This is the example of love. This is what Jesus is trying to say will be our life, will be the life of the disciples and the life of all believers. Just like Jesus only wanted to say what his father told him to say, only wanted to do what his father told him to do. That's what Jesus is talking about. That's why we're wrapped up in the love because Jesus has greater works to do, and he wants to do things that we could never do on our own. But he wants to do them through us. John 8, verse 26 through 29 says this. Jesus is talking to the, disciples, the Pharisees, trying to explain himself to the Jews. And he says, I have much to say about you and much to judge. There's a lot on my mind right now, Jesus said, and a lot of ways in which I could judge you right now. But he who sent me is true. And I declare to the world what I have heard from him. Think about that. Jesus says, there's an awful lot I could say. And one day that day will come, but that day is not now. Now my role is to let the father live through me for me to only say what my father tells me to say. Can you imagine what the world would be like if believers truly did just this one thing? If we weren't so worried about our own opinions and our own wisdom and how smart we are in responding to that comment on the internet or that chat room or whatever, but we only said what we knew the father had said to be true. Don't you think the world would have a better understanding of who Jesus Christ really is? They would look at the world and at the church and actually hear and see the bride of Christ. If we just did this one thing, Jesus said, there's much I'm going to say, I can say, and there's much I can even judge on. But you know what? My father has told me for this time, only say what I hear him say. Keep reading says the Jews didn't understand that Jesus was speaking to them about the Father, about God himself. So Jesus says to them, when you've lifted up the Son of Man, that's died, when he dies on the cross, then you will know that I am he. I'm the promised Son of, Son of God, Jesus says. And that I do nothing on my own authority, but speak just as the Father taught me. And he who sent me is with me. He has not left me alone, for I always do the things that are pleasing to him. This is the example. Jesus promised the Father will send the Holy Spirit in us, the encourager to love. He promises that there will come a time when we will be embraced, that his disciples will feel, and that we ourselves, we can know that we are in the love of the Father. We will know that we're in Christ. We'll know that Christ is in us. We have that ability now. And he says, and if you want to see what that looks like, I promise you can look at me. Because I am the example of what I want to do through you. It's that relationship of love. That's why. Go back to John chapter 14 now and look at something we already read, but we may have missed it. John chapter 14, verse 15 and 16. The first verses that we spoke about today. Jesus said this. If you love me, you will keep my commandments. And I will ask the father. Look at those words. I will ask the father. 
See, Jesus even then is showing us an example of what he's talking about. He's saying, I'm going to go to my father and I'm going to ask him to send you the Holy Spirit. Now, if you look in the book of Joel, the prophet Joel, and we don't have time to turn there, but in Joel chapter 2, we find that God prophesies to, through Joel and says, in those last days, I'm going to put my Holy Spirit in man. And young men will prophesy and women will dream dreams and it's going to be amazing. I'm going to put my Holy Spirit in my people. Apostle Peter in Acts chapter 2 explains that this is exactly what he's talking about. When the Pentecost happened and the day of Pentecost came and the Holy Spirit went into the apostles and the disciples there in the upper room. And they went out and they started sharing the mighty works of God. And Peter says this is a fulfillment of what God had already said. But think about this. If God had already said it back in Joel's day, prophet Joel hundreds of years before Jesus came on the earth, then why did Jesus say, I'll go and ask the Father? Because that's the answer to our question. What does it mean to ask in my name? Jesus is showing us here. I'm going to go and ask the Father something that I know the Father already wants. I'm going to ask according to his will. I'm going to ask him as if this is something I know he already desires to have happen. It's not my will. It's the Father's will. So I'm going to ask him for things that he already wants to do. We can see that in small ways in our families. How many times have we, have, as when we were younger and our parents said this, or maybe we as older and the parents say, Hey, who wants ice cream? And the car goes crazy, right? Who wants ice cream or, or whatever the dessert of choice or whatever? And all the kids go, yeah. You think the father didn't know that already? He's just asked, why is he asking? He's asking because it's that love relationship. And Jesus said, I'm going to go and ask the father. Because I already know this is his desire. And in that love relationship, I'm going to ask according to his will. See, Jesus only asked the Father what he already knew the Father wanted because he had determined that the Father would live through him. His Father's will, his Father's words, his Father's deeds, everything would be the Father living through him. And Jesus says, I'm your example for that. The reason I'm going to give you the Holy Spirit is so that the same thing will happen in you. Even in the garden, as Jesus prayed, so strongly that sweat of blood came off his brow. His whole prayer was wrapped up in one thought. Not my will, but yours be done. Not my will, Father. Your will be done. John, in writing his letter in 1 John chapter 5, verses 14 and 15, says, This is the confidence we have. This is the confidence that we have towards God, that if we ask anything according to his will, means knowing he already wants it, he hears us. And if we know that he hears us in whatever we ask, we know that we have the requests that we asked of him. You want to get a yes to every prayer you ever pray? Ask according to the will of the Father. Now, how do we know the will of the Father? How do we hear the Spirit we're going to discuss that, Lord willing, next Sunday. Or actually, the following Sunday. Next Sunday, we have a guest preacher, and Jonathan Agarwal has said, I want to say one last word, so it's going to be exciting. But Lord willing, in two weeks, and if Jesus comes back before then, you can ask him yourself. But anyway, Jesus says, not only will I place the encourager within you, not only will I embrace you with my love and the Father's love at all times, but I'm going to show you my example. And if you will love me and keep my words, treasure what I say to you, listen to me as I lead you even now, I'm going to do greater things through you. And that's what Jesus says, next. 
Let's finish the passage. John 14, go to verse 22, because we skipped over that. Verses 22 and 23. Judas, not Iscariot, the other Judas said to Jesus, Lord, how is it that you will manifest yourself to us and not to the world? Manifest simply means reveal yourself to. Explain and describe so that people can know who you are. Why are you going to do that to us and just not to the world? And Jesus answered him, if anyone loves me, he will keep my word. That's that word again. And my father will love him and we will come to him and make our home with him. In other words, I will manifest myself to the world. I'm just going to use you to do it. My plan is that not that I just go and share who I am, but that I do it through my disciples, through my apostles, through my sent ones, through the people that come to me in faith, and I change them and shape them and make them new and give them new birth and put my spirit in them in a manner that the world cannot explain in any way. And they're going to walk in love and joy and grace and power, my power. And I am going to build my kingdom through my church. Down to verse 25 of John 14. These things I've spoken to you while I'm still with you. But the helper, that Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things. And bring to your remembrance all that I have said to you. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. Not as the world gives do I give to you. Let your, not your hearts be troubled, neither let them be afraid. You heard me say to you, I'm going away, and I'll come to you. If you have loved me, you would have rejoiced, because I'm going to the Father. For the Father is greater than I. Now, I've told you before it takes place, so that when it does take place, you may believe I will no longer talk much with you, for the ruler of this world is coming. He has no claim on me. And again, we will read, go over these passages, Lord willing, two weeks. But look at verse 31. There's that example again. But I do as the Father has commanded me, so that the world may know that I love the Father. Rise, let us go from here. Jesus says, when you love me, you're going to keep my words. You're going to treasure. You're going to want to listen to me. You're going to want to have that relationship with me. You're going to want to spend time with me. You're going to want to read my words that I give to you in print and also hear my spirit speaking to you. And when you do that, I'm going to live through you and the world is going to know that you love me. I think the world has not known how much we love the Father because we haven't really focused on loving him and listening to him. We start getting our own agendas, our own thoughts. We start worrying about this, that, or the other. And Jesus says, listen, believe in me and love me. And you will find out that my relationship with you is all you need. I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. And that's why Jesus can promise greater works than these. I'm going to end with a quote. And I'm going to leave that up there, and I'm going to be a bad teacher, because I know the answer is the moment you give somebody a piece of paper, they stop listening. And the moment I put that up there, you stop listening. But I want you to listen anyway, and we will read this. What are these greater works that Jesus promised? Here's the answer. The Bible doesn't say. It doesn't. And I think the reason that the Bible doesn't specifically say what the greater works are is because he's not done yet. As of the writing of the scripture and the end of God's written word, Jesus isn't done with his church yet. Amen? We're still doing mighty works. And the Holy Spirit is still doing mighty works through us. And his church is still expanding and growing and seeing God glorified. It started, we see, with Peter, where he speaks, and no, it's not just him. The Holy Spirit speaks through him in Acts chapter 2, and he gives this amazing sermon, and thousands of Jews who had rejected Jesus now believe in him because they see the Holy Spirit in him. Later on, the apostle Paul saw church after church after church become born 
in so many faraway lands because the Holy Spirit was through him building his church, the Spirit of Jesus Christ. And Hudson Taylor, famous missionary who for over 50 years served in inland China, said this, all God's giants have been weak men who did great things for God because they reckoned, or that means they understood, he was with them, his being with them. God wants to do amazing things through you and through me. And we can't even know what those are yet. I believe when Paul talks in 1 Corinthians around chapter 2 says, No eye has seen or ear has heard what God has planned for his believers. I think that speaks even today, not just in heaven. God's got greater works. Jesus says, I promise you, you will do greater works than these because I go to the Father. And when I go to the Father, I'll make a way for you so that you can be forgiven forever because I'm going to the cross. I'll make a way for you that your future is covered because you will be with me and my Father in heaven forever. That's already taken care of. You're forgiven. You're set free. And then I will work through you because I'll send my Holy Spirit. So what are we supposed to do with this in closing? Live in the truth of what Jesus has promised. And love him. Love him. Seek his best. Jesus told his disciples that, and they're in that upper room. Love isn't just about sentimental feelings. Because every one of those disciples felt they loved Jesus. And how they wanted to respond and show Jesus that they loved him was to ignore what he was saying, argue with him, and tell him, no, Jesus, you're wrong. I'll never deny you. And Jesus just got done saying, you're all going to fall away. You cannot follow me. He, Jesus has just said in Matthew, you know, this is going to be a fulfillment of Scripture. When you strike the shepherd, the sheep will scatter. And all the disciples said, wasn't talking about me. No, because they thought love was just this sentimental feeling. No, love is desiring Jesus' best. Do you desire, do I desire Jesus' best? Bow with me, won't you? Let's pray. God, the truth of the matter is, I want to. I fail you so many times, God, and, and yet you still love me and call me your child, call me your son. God, I, I want to love you fully. Thank you for Jesus. Thank you that even as he was face to face with a room full of people calling him a liar, even though he was God, he responded in mercy and grace and said, I know what you're going through. And I love you. And I want your best, which is being with me forever. God, thank you for that. Help us all right now to reaffirm our love for you by desiring to keep your words, to guard your words, to want to spend time with you, reading your word, listening to your spirit, that will spend time in prayer just talking with you for no other reason but that we love you. And God, I'm going to pray in your name because I know this is your will. Will you fulfill the promises you gave to us? You've already given us your Holy Spirit. Thank you for filling that promise. Those of us who believe in you. God, would you give us that embrace we need to feel sometimes? And God, would you help us follow your example of letting you live your life, your will, your desires through us more and more. May the prayer of John the Baptist be our prayer as well, Father. You must increase and I must decrease. 
All this we ask in the name of Jesus, because we know this is the will of Jesus our Lord. Amen and amen.